to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Psalms. Make your way over to the 30th Psalm, if you will, Psalm 30. Uh, We'll study out of that psalm today a message I've entitled, From Desperation to Dancing by Divine Desire. (laughs) Desperation to Dancing. You say, well, I haven't danced in a long time. Some people say you shouldn't dance. Well, uh, there are types of dances that we shouldn't engage in. I understand that. But dancing in and of itself is not a bad thing if it's done with the right heart and the right way. Amen. Amen. Psalm 30, stand with me if you're able, if not, you can just remain seated, and we'll um, read beginning at the first verse, this short 12 verse psalm, in verse 1 of Psalm 30, the scripture says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth for a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning." And in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, May we approach it with not only enthusiasm, but eagerness to learn and to glean from your word that which we need even at this hour and for the days and weeks ahead. Father, as you feed us this morning, may it be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, may we, may we look to you for that which you provide. And Father, we, may we accept that which you give us today and not reject any of it. But Lord, may our hearts be open wide to the counsel of your word, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So perhaps a long title, but what we see in this Psalm of David is literally despair and desperation that turns into joy and gladness. And this happens by the divine grace and favor of God, if you will. So we find in these first five verses, uh, praise for deliverance. Praise for deliverance. And we all have experienced help from the Lord. Uh, but this is a, this is a psalm that, that, that contains praise at the beginning and praise at the end. And in between uh, those two sections of praise, in the middle of this psalm, there's a, there's a confession uh, that t- should typify every person of faith. Confession of sin, if you will, Um, because uh, even after we're saved by the grace of God, we yet sin. Uh, That's true according to 1 John 1, 8. And if we say that we do not sin after we've been saved by the grace of God, the truth of God is not in us and we're liars. So we know that we are and we do and we will uh, sin. And David did the same thing, and David confesses that sin. But, and there were some consequences to that, and we'll look at that. Uh, and this is a, a great um, praise, if you will, for the Lord and what he will and can do for every person who has faith in the Lord. Now, this uh, praise for deliverance we find in the first five verses 
in verse 1, you see this phrase, um, thou hast lifted me up. Thou hast lifted me up. We'll read this verse again. I will extol thee, O Lord. Why? 4 tells us why David is extolling the Lord. The word extol means to exalt, to raise up, to praise, if you will, in the highest terms. It is a high degree of praise in its strongest sense. I will extol thee. And the reason that he's extolling the Lord is because God lifted him up. Uh, to lift up, if you will, means to draw up or out. Uh, it's, like, it's like pulling a bucket out of a well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that is a deep, dark place in our life where we need, where we need to be delivered um, and where we request to be delivered. And the one who has experienced the darkest moments of despair uh, or trouble or difficulty in their lives, whether it be through illness or persecution or some other reason, um, we need the Lord to deliver us and our help comes from the Lord. We must recognize that. If we ever think that we're able to climb, our, to climb by ourselves out of our despair, we're in trouble. And we'll see the essence of that in the middle of our psalm here. But at this point, David is praising God for having drawn him out of the most difficult of circumstances. And he mentions in this first verse um, difficulty with others. He says, and hast uh, not made my foes to rejoice over me. So da uh, David has been drawn out like a bucket from a well, if you will, out of all this difficulty and trouble. The enemy was upon him. And we've studied uh, David many times, and we all know the story of David and how that he was a hunted man and he hid in caves. There were many that, that sought his demise. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. And at least they wanted to get him off the throne. David was a man after God's own heart. But there were many who thought he shouldn't be king and, and fought. Even his own son tried to kill him at one point in time. And we know that the evil that came upon him and his family was because of the sin in his life. Uh, he committed uh, adultery, and then he, he murdered someone by hire, if you will, in order to try to cover it up. Those are both pretty serious infractions against the Lord. Uh, sin at the core, if you will. Yet David confessed that sin, and when we confess our sins, it doesn't remove the chastening or discipline from us. It restores fellowship with God, but God still chastens those whom he loves, according to Hebrews uh, tw chapter 12 and verse 5. But what we find here is um, from his desperate circumstances, uh, there were many foes who sought to rejoice over him, rejoice over his demise, over his undoing over his fall, if you will, from the throne. He was persecuted. He was pursued <clears throat> on every front, many times surrounded with no hope and no way to go out except through the Lord. And the pain and pressure on his life was immense from his enemies, his foes mentioned here in this first verse. So uh, the hatred, the antagonism, and the opposition that he faced was immense. And we in our lives, we may not have been in a military battle and such. Some of us have been in the military and been in war zones. Um, but, but, you know, David was personally responsible um, for the wars in his, of his country. And, and at times he was personally persecuted uh, because they didn't want him to be in that position of responsibility. So David had personal attacks on his life. Personal attacks on his life. Uh, now many of us have not had that. And I remember many times in my life because of the job that I had, that I had many threats against my life. I had threats against my family's life. And I understand that. And there's no greater comfort in the midst of all of that than to know that we're in the hands of a mighty God who's more powerful than all of our enemies and all our foes. And if it had it not been for the comfort of the Lord during those times, I don't know what I would have done. I would have had no hope at all. Uh, and I'd have been worried to death. But through Christ, 
through Christ, through faith in Christ, we can face the most difficult of circumstances. So when somebody, somebody came to me and says, you know, so-and-so said he's going to plant a bomb under your vehicle, uh, you know, I have to be concerned about that, right? And so I take necessary steps to make sure that I don't step into a vehicle that's got a bomb under it. I mean, I literally had these things happen to me. But through all of that, I knew that I didn't have to worry about what somebody was going to do. Because the scripture says, don't worry about what man can do to you. Worry about what God's going to do if you're not obedient and faithful to him. Uh, David here uh, extolled the Lord for having drawn him out of all these difficult circumstances. And in verse 2, not only difficulty and trials and trouble, but illness, illness and weakness. We've all experienced illness to some extent. We've probably all made at least one trip to an emergency room because it was a dire emergency. Maybe some of us have had a prognosis upon our life about a terminal disease or illness of some kind. Maybe it's still lingering there in our life. David extols the Lord here in verse 2, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee and thou hast healed me. And he, he, he praises God from perhaps a near-death experience, at least some difficult circumstance medically in his life. The healing is that which is desired from some malady in our lives. And David extols God and praises him to the highest level for having helped him when there was sickness. Because God is the great physician, there's no one else that can do that. If you look back to Psalm 6 and verse 2, a psalm we studied not long ago, the Psalm 6 and verse 2, also a psalm by David. In verse 2 there, we saw where David said, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Literally, he was in agonizing pain physically. And then if you take a look over at Psalm 103, we'll see a similar uh, circumstance there, also by David in Psalm 103 in the first verse. He says, bless the Lord, which is literally praising God, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, because God is gracious and kind and tender loving towards his children. In verse 3, he says, forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. So we go back to our psalm and we see this great praise for God having delivered David from his foes and having healed him from illness and sickness. And then in verse 3 of Psalm 30, we see this phrase, he kept me alive. It says, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. David here wasn't thinking about himself. And we see this clearly even a little uh, more so later in the psalm, David was praising God, not just for keeping him alive, but for keeping him alive for a definite purpose, and that is to give glory to God. When we, when we, want, when we want our life to be sustained, when we don't want this illness to overcome us, and we don't want to be taken out through some disability, oftentimes, even for the believer, it's out of selfishness. And there should be no selfishness. Remember, it's never about us. It's always about the Lord. And we should never picture ourselves by way of deliverance from whatever it may be just for our own personal benefit. It should always be for the glory of God. The scripture says, do all to the glory of God. Whatsoever things you do. It means even when we pray, even when we go to the Lord with requests that are very serious, we go to the Lord that he might sustain our life as David did, and the Lord sustains our life not just so we can live another day, but so that we can praise God another day. We can give testimony and witness to God. Yet, for more occasions. And in verse 3, he says, You brought my soul uh, brought up my soul uh, from the grave. And when you combine this with the healing at the end of verse 2, you pick up that, uh, that thought that, that rings clearly here that there was some near-death experience for him. Maybe it was some, uh, some experience where it didn't seem like he was going to be able to escape from the hands of his enemies. 
Maybe it was a sickness or an illness that seemingly was going to take his life. But either way, he extols God here for not having him go uh, to the grave, but having kept him alive. And we see uh, in verse 4, he says, because of this, he was singing unto the Lord. Now, you know, we, come to, we came to church this morning and we've, we've sung a few songs, right? We, 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 and hopefully it was done out of hearts of praise for God. Um, and not just singing songs because we like those songs or just because it's an exercise, but truly um, reaping the benefits of the thoughts and the wording of the songs that they, as they remind us of, of, of why we need to praise God and an opportunity as well just to let that praise come forth because it's been housed up maybe for a few days. But you know, it doesn't just have to be here. Uh, you know, it can be in the shower. It can be in your house. It can be walking down the street. Whenever it is, uh, I remember many of the, the days that I was running in the darkness of the night. I'd run, you know, running four or five o'clock in the morning, it's still dark. And even though I can't sing a lick by way of <laughs> musical capability, I can still praise God through song. And I can praise him even running down the street. And it doesn't have to be verbal. It can just come from the heart. How many times do you sing songs in your heart and you never even utter a word? But it's that thoughtfulness of being, uh, of being blessed by the Lord to such an immeasurable extent. Not because our circumstances are good and not because our circumstances are bad. It's because of who God is. It's because of who God is. Because our joy and our gladness transcends all of our circumstances. We don't get tied up in the muck and mire of our daily conditions because God rises above all of that. And wherever we find ourselves, we know it's good because all things work for good for those who love God are called according to his purpose. So in verse four, he says, I sing unto the Lord and he, and he reaches out to others here, even to us, O saints of his. You know, a lot of people think that unless you've done something outstandingly remarkable and beyond what any human could really do for the, for the largest extent, you can't be a saint. But you look at the New Testament epistles and you find Paul addressing the letters to the churches, to the saints of that, to the saints here, to the saints here. We're sanctified by God. We're separated by God from sin. We're separated um, from the bondage to sin and we're separated unto him to be put at his disposal for his, his use for however he wants to use us. And being saved by the grace of God, or through faith as David here, what we find is, what we find is we're able to do um, the, the amazing and remarkable things and to, and, and to live a life of peaceful, peacefulness in our hearts, not because of who we are, but because of who God is. And God has made every person who put their faith in him a saint. And so not just special people, we're all saints before the Lord if our faith is truly in Christ Jesus. Here, faith in God through David before Christ went to the cross. But says, oh, ye saints of his, sing unto the Lord. Now we know, uh, 1 John 5, 3 tells us that we know that we love God when we keep his commandments and they're not grievous to us. But I believe part of that is singing oftentimes in our hearts. You know, uh, when, when, when you're really, when you get to a point where you just sing praises because you can't contain it, that's when you really know that you're, that you're cherishing every moment that God has given to us to live on this earth. But it's singing praises. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Uh, this remembrance is like a memorial, if you will, that creates the memory. Um, and, and so we have this memorial or remembrance of the holiness of God. And when you think about who God is and, how, and, and that he's absolutely perfect, it should give us great joy. Because, you know, we're living in a world where nobody's perfect. Nobody on this earth is perfect. And we look to examples in this lifetime of ours of people that rise above um, 
uh, the unrighteousness and the evil and the wickedness of this world to live a life that is righteous and, and, and truly spiritually pure in the eyes of God. And all of that reflects the glory of God. Those who would live their lives as godly people, as we saw in Psalm 1, are those people who glorify the Lord. And it's the holiness of God, not only that possesses them, but motivates them and, and drives them to a higher purpose in their life, not to seek their own things, but to seek those things which are above. And David gets to the essence of this through this remembrance of God's holiness. Have you ever just broke out in song because of your mindful of the righteousness and the holiness of God? Uh, just thinking about who God is. And that's, that's, that's the meat of the song. Because we don't just praise God because it's expected of us. We don't just praise God because that's what other believers do. We don't just praise him because that's what the word says. We praise him because we truly have heartfelt love for God and for who he is. It's not just an exercise in, in, to make us happy. It's that which pleases the Lord because he'll get the rocks to come up with praise if need be. But we're going to praise him. Those of, his, those of his children called saints. Now, in the fifth verse... Um, we find this, uh, a couple of, um, uh, analogies here, not analogies, but a couple of, um, juxtaposition of terms that really describe where David is as he's praising the Lord here. Because in the next section, beginning with verse six, David's going to get into the sin, uh, that he committed, the disobedience for which he was guilty of. And before he expresses that, he looks in verse 5, and he says, For his anger endureth but for a moment. Uh, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And what David is speaking of here is this anger, this anger which causes the crying or weeping, is brief. It's momentary. Remember that if we put our faith truly in Christ... We've got an eternity to live with our Savior beyond this life. An eternity. There's no end to that. There's no end. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, but in reality, we have a mind that's limited. And that's the way God designed us. And it's limited in the sense that we cannot fully conceive of eternity. We can't fully conceive of that. We measure things by days and weeks and months, years, hours, seconds, microseconds. If you don't think you measure things, uh, next time you break out your computer or your cell phone and it doesn't respond right away, you're sitting there thinking, why is this taking so long? Uh, remember when you used to have to look things up in the encyclopedia? Uh, now you, in three seconds, you can get an answer to almost anything you want, right? So we do measure things, and we consider those things important, but we measure things. But you know, in heaven, in heaven, for our home, because this is not our home, we're strangers living in an evil world right now. This is, as I called it last week, this is the devil's battlefield right here. And when we get to glory, as our body is glorified, the time is not even a matter of conscience. It's not even a matter of conscience because everything just is and it will never change. And so in heaven, we won't be thinking about days or weeks. Yeah, we sing the song Amazing Grace and say when we've been there 10,000 years, it's as we just begun. But when we get to heaven, we'll be thinking about 10,000 years. We're not measuring time. Oh, by the way, there's only one day in heaven. It's eternal. There's no night. <laughs> one eternal day that lasts forever. So in the span of this lifetime, the 70 or plus years that we have, this anger of God because of what we've done, this anger of God that is directed towards us is only brief and it serves a purpose. And it's that which brings us back into fellowship with God. So the anger of God that is directed at us is righteous anger. It's righteous anger, much like when Jesus cleansed the temple. 
and chased the money changers out because they turned the house of God into a commercial establishment. But God got angry about that and he did something about it. Well, guess what? When we sin, God's angry with us. And, but look at this, what David says, this anger only endures for a little bit. And what happens is, um, it says the weeping endures for a night. That means it's brief. Because you know what? There's hope in the Lord. At the end of verse 5, it says, but our joy cometh in the morning. This anger causes us to cry, if you will, and the favor of God, the favor of God. Look at that. Um, it says, uh, "By his, uh, in his favor is life. In his favor is life. Favor is God's desire. It's God's will. It's what brings him pleasure. And guess what? Giving us advantages and benefits brings God pleasure, but only when we're obedient. And so this crying and mourning that we have is only brief and momentary. When God gets our attention, we confess our sin and there's joy in the morning. And oh, by the way, it's it's beautiful thing when God releases us, because in John 1, 9, it says after we confess our sins, uh, it says that God will forgive us of all unrighteousness. That's our God. We confess the sin and God forgives us. Now, these next few verses in verses 6 to 10, after looking at his praise for deliverance here in these first five verses, we now go into a section I call penitence over disobedience. Penitence over disobedience. Penitence means uh, sorrow or regret. It's godly sorrow. Not just sorry that we got caught, but it's true godly sorrow for having committed uh, the transgression with God um, for having done wrong. It, uh, this penitence I talk about over disobedience means repentance. It's having a heart of contrition. A heart of contrition is a heart that it, 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 David expressed that in Psalm 51. This heart of contrition is one that is literally crushed, crushed by God because we've disappointed him. We've let him down. We've transgressed against him. And the re full reality of that sin comes to bear upon our mind and our heart. And we're literally crushed by that. So we go to the Lord and we confess that sin. David expressed his godly sorrow here. In verse 6, he says, And in my prosperity, now I don't think prosperity means financial wealth. Uh, this prosperity... Uh, literally means rest or ease, rest or ease. It can mean security or a feeling of sufficiency. And that's the essence of this word. It does not mean financial wealth. And he's talking about in the ease of his life. There, were there are times in our life when we're just sort of kicked back in the easy chair, figuratively speaking, and we're just sort of cruising along waiting for the next bad thing to happen, right? No, we're just thinking everything's going to be okay. It's okay now. And we're just sort of cruising along in life. And this is the picture David tries to paint in his ease, his prosperity. What is his attitude in that, in his prosperity? He said, I shall never be moved. I shall never be moved. That is, I'm not going to be shaken. There comes times in our life where we feel our circumstances and our conditions that are prevailing are great. And nothing can move us off of that. Nothing can shake us and get us trembling about that. We just feel at ease and it's okay, right? So in verse 7, he goes on to say, Lord, by thy favor. Again, um, the, the pleasure and delight of God, God's will. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Mountain is a sign of strength. And literally, David recalls how that before he was at ease in his life, that the only reason he was able to, 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 be, to rise up above his enemies and to be defended by, uh, from his enemies and to be relieved of the pressure by his enemies and to be delivered out of his ill health was because of the power and the strength of God. 
total dependence upon the Lord, a contrast to the ease in verse 6 that he expressed. And he says, You made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Uh, and what we see here, um, the, the hiding of the face, um, is that when God withdraws his blessings from us. He withdraws his blessings from us. God gets angry with us, and he withdraws his blessings. Because God's never going to leave us nor forsake us. But he will discipline us. He'll chasten us to try to convict us and to try to get us stirred in our heart to do something about it. And when God does that, we should, like David, have contrition and be crushed in our heart over it. And what David says here, it says, You hid your face, you recalled, and you withheld your benefits. And I was troubled. You ever feel like, how many times have we seen through the scriptures where great men of God and called out and said, Lord, why did you leave me? Why did you abandon me? God's not abandoning us, but God will withdraw his benefits from us and God will try to get our attention. And at those times, we're going to be troubled. We're going to be troubled. Our, prob our biggest problem, I think, is we don't recognize why we have the trouble that we have in our life. Trouble does not always come by way of sin. I mean, for James chapter 1, verses uh, 2 and 3 tell us that there are many different kinds of trials that are going to come into our life. And they're to test our faith. God allows those trials to test our faith. It's not because we sinned. Job had these three so-called advisors that caused more grief than they ever helped. But Job, they thought Job had the trouble because he sinned. And that wasn't the problem. So there are times like Job when it's not sin in our life. Job was a just and an upright man. But God showed the world how that he can help even the most desperate of people in the most desperate of circumstances. Though the devil was allowed to get a stronghold upon Job, but not allowed to take his life, how that even a thread of life... Job was still able to say, my Redeemer lives. And we're able to do that through the most desperate of circumstances. But you know what? We get trouble. We need to understand why we have trouble. Whether it's a trial in our life and whether it's sin, you say, why do I need to figure that out? Why? Because if it's sin, we have to confess it. We have to confess it. Don't just look at all trouble in our life or all illness in our life or whatever the difficulty may be. Don't just look at it as it's just another thing in my life. We need to examine it a little closer. We need to see whether or not, because according to Hebrews chapter 12, you go on there, uh, after it says all, God will discipline all his children because he loves his children. And if you're, if you're not experiencing the discipline and chastening of God, you're an illegitimate child, which means you don't really have faith in Christ. If we truly are a child of God, we're a saint of the Lord because of our faith in Christ. We are going to, not only are we going to sin, but we're going to, we're going to find ourselves in trouble because of that. And what we need is help. And that's what David addresses as he goes on. He says um, there in verse 8, he said, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. Here's where he comes and he lays it out before the Lord. He cries to God. Because of the sin, the iniquity, the transgression that he had committed. And he says in verse 9, what profit is there? So Lord, um, I, I did this and it seems like there's no help for me. In verse 9, what benefit is there going to be for you if I go to the grave? I want to live so I can continue to praise you. He said, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Rhetorical questions that demand a... Demand an answer that's obvious here. Shall the dust praise thee? No, it's not. Shall it declare thy truth? No. David can do that while he's alive. And so David is thanking God for maintaining and sustaining his life and preserving him even through the trouble, even through the sin. We can't just take it for granted that we can just sin and God's just going to forgive Paul addressed that in the book of Romans as God forbid we would ever take that kind of an attitude. That we just sin we want to because God's just going to forgive us. We can't do that. David had true remorse here. So in verse 9, he really asked God to preserve him. 
He says, uh, uh, what profit is there in my blood? Preserve me uh, as to continue to maintain my life. Because our purpose is we want to praise you. And so in verse 10, he says, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. We don't deserve help from God. We don't deserve deliverance from difficult circumstances. We don't deserve healing. We don't deserve any of that. But by the favor of God, by his grace, by his mercy, by his kindness, we reap those benefits as being a child of God. And David spoke of those here. He says, have mercy upon me because God, you are my help. You know, there's a passage in the scripture where kings of Israel went and they sought alliance with other nations to try to help them fight against their enemies. When what they should have been doing was going to the Lord. There were time, times in the Old Testament, you see the history where armies would be gathered in great masses so they could overcome the enemy by their sheer size and power. God's word clearly says it's not by the size of your army, it's the size of your God that makes the difference. Well, David here clearly de 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 declares that God is his help. It's his total dependence upon the Lord. When we come to the point where we can humble ourselves because we admit that we've sinned and we confess the sin and that our, our desire for restoration is totally dependent upon God, then we reap real benefits from the Lord. And here they are in the last part of the psalm. So we saw the praise for deliverance in the first five verses, this penitence over disobedience. Uh, by David in the middle part. And at the end, I call it prolific delight. Prolific means abundant. Exuberance. If we take a look at verse 11, look at the ending of this psalm. Thou hast turned, this is God, thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. <laughs> you know, when you, when you get really excited and exuberant over something... You just feel like you want to dance. It's not the natural reaction. It's a reaction that comes from the Lord. Uh, just take a look, um, if you will, at 2 Samuel chapter 6. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let's take a look at something that got David really excited once upon a time. And what he did... This, this, where we're going to pick this story up, we're going to take a look at one verse, is when the Ark of the Covenant is now being brought to Jerusalem. David is finally, after years, being able to get the Ark of the Covenant, which was God's special place, to bring that back or to Jerusalem, where it belonged. Now, this is, this is not something that was just personally beneficial for David. This is something that God wanted Something that God demanded. And David was able to be used by God to deliver what he wanted. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, look at verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. Literally, vigorously danced before the Lord. Now for all those who think that dance is vulgar and evil in any form or circumstance... I challenge you to find evil in that dancing. David danced with all his might. Now, you know what? Somebody did find error with it. His wife looked out and said, he's making a fool of himself out there. He was dancing so strong that his wife thought he was a fool out there in the street. The king is out in the street dancing like a fool. That's what, that's what pure delight of God will do. To a person of God who really finds blessings from the Lord. We're even going to break out in dancing. Look at back at uh, Psalm 30 and verse 11. You've turned my mourning into dancing. And oh, by the way, that dancing that David did, bringing the ark uh, back to Jerusalem, was in public. It was in public. You've heard the expression... Dance like nobody's looking, right? <laughs> That's what David did. That's what he did. He danced like nobody was watching. 
Now, I know some of us are going to say, you know what? I'd never break out in a foolish dance like that. Make myself look so silly. What are we willing to do for the Lord? Are we little, what David is saying is we shouldn't restrain our emotions. God gave us emotions. Use them in a righteous manner. God gave us feelings and emotions, and he wants us to use them in a right way. And one expression, I'm not saying everybody should do that, but one expression of those righteous and godly thoughts is to break out in dancing because God has removed the mourning and the weeping that only lasts for a night. But joy comes in the morning. And when it comes, we recognize that God has given the deliverance that God has miraculously, supernaturally worked a miracle in our life. Why hold back? Because David did it for the Lord. And here we say that because God has delivered him, his mourning gets turned into dancing. And not only that, he says, Thou hast put, put off my sackcloth, those things that, that you do when you total, feel totally humbled by your circumstances. And he says, God removed the sackcloth and girded him with gladness. So mourning turned to dancing, sackcloth turned to gladness. And in verse 12, he says, to the end, the phrase to the end means for this purpose, for this purpose. Why is he dancing? Why is he so happy? It tells us the word that tells us why in verse 12, that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. Too often we get so stiff minded and stiff hearted that we just want to clam up and we don't want to express any feelings or emotions about the Lord because that might seem foolish to somebody. What did Paul say? He says the foolishness of preaching. He preached the Lord and the world considered it foolish. But even though others considered him to be foolish and looked upon him like a spectacle, Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but knew it was the power of God unto salvation. In Romans 1.16, we need to understand when God delivers us, when God gives us favor and we, we, we literally break out in song and dance and gladness and joy, it testifies of God and it gives witness to God and it'll bring a testimony to others that this is what God has done because somebody's going to ask us, why are you dancing? Why are you laughing? Why are you smiling? Right? And we have an answer. If we would just not be silent. David said in the middle of verse 12 there, and not be silent. The worst thing a believer can do is to not talk about it. To not show the emotions. And just clam up and just sort of be the sophisticated uh, spiritual person that we intend to be. You know, there's a time to be serious. There's a time for this, a time for that. We find from Ecclesiastes. But there's a time for dancing. There's a time for laughing. There's a time for rejoicing. There's a time for singing. And it's time when we're delivered, we experience these great blessings from God. And we want to share those with others. And these expressions of joy will cause others to wonder. And some will call us fools. Would you risk being a fool for the cause of Christ? I hope so. Look at the end of the verse. As we close, it says, O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. I'm not going to be silent, David said. <laughs> I'm not going to be silent. I'm not going to house up this praise. I'm going to continue to shower the Lord with praise. I'm going to extol him to the highest extent, to the highest level. I think sometimes we... We, 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 we get so, we, we hibernate in a shell of sophistication when we need to break out with rejoicing and dancing and song. Well, the world can see what God can do. Because you know what? When you're dancing, typically it means you're happy about something. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I, I, I think about how people receive the message of God. And I'll say this. Does this mean you need to walk out of here and start dancing in the street? No, it's not what it means. What it does mean is don't inhibit the joy of God from emanating from you when you receive the blessings of the Lord. Don't house it up. Let it go. However that comes out in a righteous manner. 
Let it go. But dancing is one of those. Singing is one of those. And joy and rejoicing and laughter is another. And you know what? Even a smile can go a long way at the right time. And people see why you're so happy. And so understand that David went from desperation to dancing by the divine favor of God. By the divine favor of God. If it comes from the flesh, that's why there's a lot of churches filled this morning with all kinds of contemporary music, rock music, that is justified in the church through some poor spiritual lyrics in most cases. People are jumping and rejoicing and dancing. Much of that, much of that is done from the flesh. Let it be from the Spirit. Let it be from the Spirit. Not from the flesh. You know, um, uh, before we got saved, uh, Mary, my wife, she, she loved to dance. She loved to dance. We stopped dancing when we got saved. out in public. It was all the wrong venues and all the wrong times. So that was for the flesh. We don't dance for the flesh anymore. We don't do that. That's fleshly stuff. So there are people that within the church confines, they take the elements that are in the world the fleshly elements, and they've brought them into the church, and they're now rejoicing in a fleshly manner in the church because the church has permitted it, the church has sanctioned it, and the church is promoting it, and it's spreading like a wildfire. I'm not talking about that kind of dancing. I'm talking about the kind of praise that comes from a pure heart that seeks the Lord in obedience. That's what God will do in our moments of desperation. He'll bring us out like drawing a bucket out of a well. He'll bring us right out and turn our mourning into dancing. Let's stand together, if you will. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. You are God, Almighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords. Our Father in heaven, we come even now to give testimony and witness of who you are, holy and righteous and pure in every way. And Father, may our life be one that exemplifies that purity and that holiness. And Father, when we mess things up, we thank you, Father, for the chastening that brings us to our knees in repentance and then brings happiness and joy and gladness. Father, we just thank you for delivering us because you are our help. We have no other helper. You are our help. We can't even help ourselves, much less no one else can help us. May our trust and our faith and our dependence be dependent, be totally upon you as we submit ourselves entirely to your care because we know that there's a day coming that will be eternal and we'll have a glorified body living in your presence if we truly have our faith in you now. So if there be any here today who have not put their faith in Christ, Father, touch that heart or those hearts today that they might, that they might in faith come to Christ, repenting of their sins, turning from their sins, that they might receive by your grace the free gift of salvation. We thank you and praise you for what you'll do in our midst, even at this hour, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.